Welcome to Healthy Planet, the show for people who care about their health and the health of our planet on the Think Tech live streaming network series. I'm your host, Dr. Grace O'Neill. Joining me today is Tyrone Monteri, president and founder of Protect and Preserve Hawaii. Today, we're going to talk about native Hawaiian plants. So let's get into it. Tell us about Protect and Preserve Hawaii, Tyrone. How you got started? Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, so one day I was just walking to work. Uh, I saw a sign on the house saying it was going to be up for auction. I went to that auction hoping to get some kind of rental property. Um, I took out a loan against my house and then hoping for a rental property or a sweet condo. Um, I ended up coming home with 330 acres of wow. preservation land instead. Um, yeah, I didn't know what to do with it. I just was, I just thought it was a good opportunity to own that much land for you. So um, I definitely kind of freaked out. Um, I started doing research and reaching out to organizations that dealt with large land acquisitions. Um, and then um, just familiarizing myself with the area, I started talking with the community and just hiking the area, just trying to figure things out. Um, after all of that, it just seemed like the right thing to do is to that I was meant to be its last steward. So in 2019, we started Protect and Preserve Hawaii to do so. Um, from, from there, we started doing research. Um, COVID hit. Um, the only funding that I did have, I ended up losing. Um, I was to do some money for my 401k to keep going on. And in October 2020, we started our active restoration and our volunteer program. Since then, we've removed around two acres of invasive species and planted around 3,000 native Hawaiian plants. So, the initial plot of land, where was it? Yeah, so it's actually it's called Pio Valley. It's located on the east side of Milwaukee, actually behind Pio Valley. And uh, you guys planted some plants there first, and then you started going to other locations, I understand, as well. Yeah, you know, when I was thinking about what I was going to do with the, the property, you know, I wanted it, I wanted to get the most out of the natural resources and have it benefit the most amount of people. But once we started our volunteer program, um, because of COVID as well, there wasn't too many options for a lot of people. So we did get a lot of demand. Uh, once our program started being successful, I wanted to help out other programs. So we started a volunteer exchange. Um, where we help out other projects or organizations with, you know, some of the work that they do, and also just to change it up a bit. Um, and also, a big bottleneck is just outreach. So I ended up having kind of a a knack at it. So I started trying to help do outreach for other organizations too. So how did and you then, become? Oh, oh, go ahead. I don't oh no, we also have guided hikes. So I have a botanist that works with us. He actually oh, no. lives down the road from the valley, so he kind of has a personal connection. So we just uh, we try to check out other um, intact ecosystems around the island. Mm -hmm. Kind of that gateway. Um, we get to go on a hike and learn a little bit about the, the plants. How did you start getting interested in botany and native Hawaiian plants? Yeah, so the funny thing is that I'm actually an auto mechanic by trade. <laughs> and before purchasing the property, I had no interest in plants or conservation. <laughs> um, well, that's yeah, so it was kind of out of necessity that, I, you know, I wanted to research and just dive into this conservation journey. Um, it did help just having a lot of support from the community and like like-minded individuals. Like, there's like maybe like two botanists that live in the valley that actively help us out a lot. So that was a big help. Yeah, I mean, I'm wondering um, what kind of native Hawaiian plants are you planting out there? Because I don't really know a lot about native Hawaiian plants. Can you tell us a little bit about them? Yeah, of course. So um, I didn't either. So first thing I did is start hiking with my botanist. And um, we started surveying, which we call just researching um, areas that are still intact with a similar um, environment. And then we kind of chose um, which plants would naturally grow in that area since it's so heavily degraded. So two of the main, um, I guess you would call it workhorse species that we plant is autoleaf, which is um, 
call it a hot bush. Um, and ancient Hawaiians used to use it for um, spears and fence poles. But it's a very hardy plant that works really well to what was that? compete against invasive polypora, which is one of the invasive species we deal with a lot. Um, the other one is really witty, uh, which is known as the balsa of Hawaii. It's a very light um, tickle wood, but Hawaiians would use it for like outriggers or surfboards or canoes. Um, and that one, and both of those plants, we collect the seed uh, from, from the next valley over. Um, and pretty much all the plants that we grow and plant out is from the same area, so from southern Hawaii. Um, just so the genetically that they're they're disposed to be in the that area and they sort of have the best um, chance of survival. Yeah. Yeah. Do you, you find that it's pretty easy to grow these plants from seed? Um, or not? <laughs> well, I had no experience, so I, I I had I went through a lot of trial and error, but um, we also offer um, um, propagation tutorials as well on our hikes. So we'll collect some seeds and then we'll we'll give it to them in packets and some information, and they're actually fairly easy to grow because oh, they're great. adapted to the climate. Right? Yeah, that's great. I mean, so you're actually offering these to the public or how are volunteers or how does it work? Yeah, so we have five events a month and all of them are posted on our website. Um, protect and, sorry, protectpreservehi.org. Um, mm -hmm. And there's like a mail list for each one. <clears throat> but it's, everything's open to the public. Yeah, I mean, I think that would be great to get other people planting things in their own yard because it's... Uh, that that would really help the situation. I mean, I see you have, I think I just saw an ohia there. Can you tell us a little bit about the ohia trees? Yeah, the, we have multiple ohias on our property as well. Um, it's it's just got named the endemic tree of Hawaii. Uh, we're not familiar about that. I think officially it was July 1st was the official date. Um, and that's actually the keystone species. So it's one of the first species to come back. Uh, after lava flow, um, that's and it's kind of the basis of the native plant forest and how it regenerates itself. So, uh, we actually do. There's slower growing plant, but it's definitely important. So we do all plant that as well. Um, just the uh, workhorse species definitely grow faster, and then we slowly, uh, strategically plant the uh, and some of the other like more special species that take longer to grow. Now, I know there is that disease on the big island, at least, where a lot of the ohia is being essentially extinguished by, I think, an insect or something like that, or I'm not sure what it is. Uh, but uh, is that a problem here at all? Do you know? Um, there's some very, there's a few small cases, but not as much. We have a wide variety of ohia, so uh, we've been lucky enough to have just a few um, controlled areas that have been. And then there's definitely a protocol if, you, if someone spots a tree that might have it, then they'll try to, <clears throat> they'll try to keep them in quarantine in that area. Mm -hmm. Now, with the ohia, do they need a lot of water, or what is their ideal situation? Um, that's that's a hard call. I mean, a lot of the, the rural, I don't want to say plants, but ornamental plants in general tend to do better up at the summit. Just because it's harder to get to, so you know, a lot of there's a lot less foot traffic and a lot less. Yeah, that's the that can get to it. Yeah. yeah. So, well, we do have a few lowland species of ohia on our property as well, so they can grow in drier climates, but they definitely thrive better towards the summit where it's you know moist all the time. Yeah. Well, there's like a little mist overlaying. I've seen them up there on the mountain when I've been hiking. Like I, I can't remember what ridge it is, but um like uh, at the top, I see a bunch of like little short ones. They're really short, but I've seen really tall ones on the big island too. Like on the right. east side, they have very, very tall forests, but those are the ones that are struggling, unfortunately. Uh, how about um, kukui nut? Is that a native plant? So kukui is actually, they call it a canoe plant. So it was actually um, introduced from my canoe or from the um, Polynesian islands. So it wasn't actually found here at Mm-hmm. Is that invasive or no? It doesn't... It's actually it's not invasive. It, it actually thrives well here, um, and it has a lot of cultural value as well. So a lot of people do use it in restoration. 
Um, it makes a really good shade tree as well. And then, of course, you can use the wood and mm -hmm. the seed. Mm -hmm. And how about you? You mentioned before the invasive species, the Halicoa. Um, do you know some of the history behind how it was brought here and everything? Yeah, so oh. in our area, um, the, towards the drier area, um, we deal with a lot of Halicoa as well as guinea grass. That's our two main, mm -hmm. um, I don't know if you call it enemies, but <laughs> we deal with that a lot. Um, from, what, from what we gathered, it was probably brought in for like cattle feed or for livestock, you know. And at that time, nobody knew, you know, how well. I mean, obviously they grew because it was it was low maintenance and it grew fast, but yeah. they got out of hand. Now all over the highways, you'll you'll see that. Um, so yeah, so we've been dealing with that a lot. The only real way to get rid of like the guinea grass is to remove it by its roots, and then the poly <laughs> pool we actually. Do like a cut stump method where we cut it close to the ground and then we use like a herbicide and that control. Uh, yeah, I mean, do you guys do any of that, or uh, when you're planting the native plants, try to kill the hollycoas first and then and then plant the native plants? Yep. So we actually leave some of the hollycoa behind, which strategically so it has shade for the seedlings, yeah. and then we remove some, um, and then using the herbicide. Um, as long as we're not too close to the stream, it's, it should be fine. Mm -hmm. uh, if we're closer to the stream, we'll do a different technique where we'll just remove all the bark from the, the polypore and then it'll slowly die that way. Yeah. So with the herbicide, what are you using as herbicide? It's called Garnon. It's like a professional herbicide. Oh. Yeah. So we can probably go to like, um, these are the last few things supplies. So, uh huh. Okay. I mean, are you able to use, um, like, someone told me if you put oil in it, like cooking oil, sometimes that'll kill it? Oh, uh, yeah, so the oil is kind of like a, they call it a surfactant. It kind of um, helps the, the herbicide penetrate the plant. But just oil by itself, I'm not sure. I never tried that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I heard some people like inject it in or something. I mean, and then someone else told me they use an aluminum can. They cut it down to the stump and then try to block out all the light and then yeah. eventually it'll die. But it's very hardy. Like I tried doing that. And if you just, you know, it'll, the branches will grow around. And then once it gets a few leaves, it just takes off again. You know, it's a difficult situation. So tell me about, um, I know you said the two most common native plants, but what other plants are yeah, you yeah. Ooh, um, I don't know what science it is, but we plant like Alahede, um, also Po'okela, which is, sort of, um, we call it Biden, but it's related to the um, sunflower family. So it looks like a little sunflower. Oh, um, yeah, I've seen that. I think I've seen that growing. Yeah. yeah. Small, and, though. Yeah, small. And then we do like vines. It's called a Viki Viki. It has a little purple flower. almost looks like um, an orchid. And that um, yes, we nice try thing. to do like a whole planting. So we do like grasses too. So like um, PB grass, um, carrots. Um, and the reason for all that <clears throat> is that whole ecosystem has to be complete. You just can't have all shade trees or just all grass if you want that watershed to work correctly. So to absorb water. So we mm -hmm. try to plant ground cover, shrubs, and shade trees. Yeah. Um, we also plant no and male. Um, let's see. Wait, and then, like a ground cover kind of shrub is we plant mallow, which is the Hawaiian cotton. And it actually has the balls of cotton on it as well. I think I've seen that too. Like, it's, it was in a it kind of, does it look like a bush or sometimes? Kind of, yeah. Yeah. Because I've seen, I've walked by, it just, it was at a house and then we picked it up. We're like, oh, it's cotton. I mean, I don't know if anybody ever uses the cotton, but. They look like little cotton balls. So, yeah. yeah. Um, what else was I going to say? So are most of these plants, are they planted, um, like you plant the seeds and then you wait until they're a certain size before you put them in the ground, um, like leave them somewhere else and let them form little seedlings before you put them in? Like, what have you found is the most successful way to plant these native plants? Yeah, definitely. At first, uh, we were getting a lot of our plants from uh, the native point plant nursery, Hufu, Maori, Ola. Um, and then, you know, just 
Um, just to be more practical, I, I started trying growing it at home, and now my house is turned into a, a greenhouse. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I got kind of carried away. And then, you know, I like, I like projects, so now I, I have at least 2,000 plants going. Oh, my gosh. Least. Yeah, wow. so. <laughs> but as far as seedlings go, um, I guess on an average, it'd probably be like 12 to 14 inches as far as like what height you wanted to outplant it. Mm -hmm. It's usually when the the seedling, the bark will start to kind of show like more woody around the stump instead of that greenish color. Yeah. Um, and then we, we they call it harding it off. So we'll, I'll slowly stop watering it as often so we can kind of handle the drought when we start cleaning out plant it. Um, and then from there, it's kind of survival of the fittest. Yeah. We don't really baby our plants. We'll plant it and we'll put water. But after that, um, we don't go back and water it. We just don't. Oh, you don't. Yeah. yeah. I mean, well, I guess they're native, so you think that they would be able yeah. to survive in that kind of environment. Um, yeah, so I have to say, sorry, like it's probably about 80% um, success survival rate. rate. Yeah. yeah, that's pretty good. I mean, with the volunteers, like, um, what kind of are they mostly doing the planting? Are they like, I'm assuming they're cutting some of the invasive species too. What kind of um, volunteer opportunities do you have for people? Yeah, for, so for the restoration um, opportunities, you know, we I kind of strategically do it. So the the first event that you're that's open to the public, um, we'll learn about the area on um, biodiversity watersheds, and then the, what's invasive and what's not, and then we'll remove getting grass and kind of prep the area, and then the water flow, um, and then from there you you'll be vetted um, and just familiar with the area, then. I'll, I have a special invite to our planting event, so it's oh, actually nice. separate. Yeah, so when they plant, they actually, you know, they want to be there and they, they take more care to actually make sure the tree is going to be planted correctly. And then yeah. we still do a tutorial uh, before mm -hmm. we actually do the planting, and then we actually plant the trees. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So, you know, I've seen, you know, when I've been hiking in Kulio'o, um, kind of near the valley, I've seen some plants, and I don't know if those are yours, or um, they're just like the park planted them. I mean, I'm assuming the park does some restoration, but I don't really know. Yeah, so the Kulio'o, um, just recently they have a new, I guess you would call it, like, uh, organization that's dedicated to restore that area. They're called the Little Tree Alliance, which we're oh. obviously neighbors. So um, made, I made my acquaintance and we knew each other through other organizations. So um, mm -hmm. we share resources to help each other out. Yeah. Um, they recently got a grant with the state for Kodunani, and they're actually doing all the planting as well as trying to stop the erosion and, you know, kind of put signs about people trying to cross through the yeah, Charlie Charlie Charlie. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 That also causes a lot of erosion too. So, mm -hmm. yeah, good group of people. Yeah. And then um, I also have seen, I mean, I'm just wondering um, with the other invasive species, what other invasive species are a real problem for uh, these native plants? Um, there's, there's a bunch, but definitely uh, strawberry guava is like. Oh, yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, because people eat them on the trail and they throw them on the ground. I mean, yeah, and birds know it, pigs know yeah. it, so it's very easily spread and it's yeah. very fast growing. Um, that would be like our next, I mean, as we move deeper into the forest into our restoration area, um, it's between that and Christmas berry. But strawberry guava is definitely um, a big problem because it grows so fast. Um, yeah. <clears throat> the state just released a uh, biocontrol. A uh, biocontrol being that is a biological control agent, which is it's a little insect that digs itself into the leaves. Um, from there, it'll slow down the growth of the plant. So that's been released recently. So if you ever go hiking, you'll see these, they call them dolls, but it kind of looks like a little pimple on top of the leaf. Um, that's how you know that the biocontrol is inside of that plant. Now, I wonder if that's going to do harm to the other uh, parts of the ecosystem, though, because they're always kind of releasing these controls, but, Definitely. you know, they, you know <laughs> they don't know what really other... Yeah, for sure. Yeah, because what <laughs> other effects it could have, right? I mean, 
um, it makes me wonder, but how about like the mountain apple? Like, is that a problem too? I mean, I'm just um, thinking of things that you they, eat when you're hiking and you throw on the ground. <laughs> they actually have a, a native Hawaiian apple of your park, and then um, that's what they're not in Vista. So, in Vista, it pretty much means like it's um, not only does it grow at a fast rate, but it also um, takes over the resources of all the other plants and all the pizza. Yeah, so yeah, like mango and um, mountain apple and whatnot, papaya, they're, they're not in Vista. Yeah, yeah, they this you kind of have to give them some care for them to go, <laughs> or avocados, you know. <laughs> right. Yeah. The other problem with Visa species sometimes it's just the leaf litter, like um, like strawberry guava. Like it'll leave so much leaf litter, it'll it'll, sh it'll shade out all the sun from all the the plants that's trying to grow under. Ah, uh, yeah. I mean that's too bad. Like now that I'm more cognizant of the strawberry guava, I mean I kind of knew it wasn't native, but I'll admit that I've had some on the hike and then just like you know just throwing it on the ground and. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and then there's, you know, people have grow them at their houses too, right? Because it's, it's a very nice maintenance tree. Yeah. Tree, I mean, but, it's very but, delicious, I yeah, guess. Yeah. It's tasty. So. Yeah. So that's too bad. <laughs> <laughs> and then I saw there was one picture by the um, street. Can you show the picture by the ocean or the stream, uh, Michael? Can you tell us a little bit about that? What you guys are doing there? I thought that was kind of interesting. And it's must be you're talking about this, the wall. <clears throat> yeah, so um, one day I was, we wanted to start uh, the Aula for Aula, which is a um, native Hawaiian garden with, you know, herb and food. Um, mm -hmm. But then we we're like, oh, it's kind of close to the stream. So um, I followed this one Kumu, um, his name is Kimi Onakai. He does Kuhaukuli Mohaukuli, which is the Hawaiian art of like, dry stacking of rocks for the wall. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that's what they use for hails and also to tell the time and other things. So yeah. I reached out to him and he was like, I was like, oh, would you mind helping us build a small wall for our garden? He's like, I'll do one better. You know, I'll teach you guys how to do it. Oh, so, nice. Yeah, from there it's kind of spurred off. Now we, that's once a month, you know, every last Sunday of the month, we, have, we actually have a class now. Um, that. So that's kind of our way of perpetuating Hawaiian culture, you know, in that area. Um, and he's gracefully enough to to volunteer his time to come out. So it's open, same thing to all, um, mm -hmm. everyone as well as any skill level, so beginners as well. Oh, that's um, great. Yeah, it's like practical knowledge. So. Ah, um, and I'm also kind of curious. This is a random question, but I've seen some like taro. Uh, sometimes when I'm hiking at the bottom of the trail, like, is somebody growing those? Are those, I mean, I'm assuming they're not, they're definitely not invasive because they take some work, Taro does. Mm -hmm. um, and I know it's a canoe plant, uh, but um, who is growing those Taro on the trail? You have any idea? Good question. Sometimes they're just growing naturally. Um, I mean, they're in like a definite uh, structure, like there's a, oh, you know, like you could tell someone did it and maybe someone just put it out there and they just thought, oh, it can perpetuate itself here. So I'm just going to put uh, it. Is that, is that the Makisa trail? I don't think so. I think this was maybe around Kulia. I can't remember. I've been in so many different trails. It's hard to remember. But, mm -hmm. um, yeah, it was very nicely um, built, like, you know, how it likes water. So the, it was... The water was up, and you could see like multiple taro plants, kind of in a row. Very nice. Like terracing. Yeah. Yeah, so. I'm sure it's probably yeah, somebody that's just growing for themselves or like a yeah. small little project. Mm -hmm. I mean, how do you like now? Are you going to try to acquire more land for your program, or are you just kind of helping out other organizations with similar interests? I guess it's hard because you have to raise enough money to acquire land, but. I think that's a great idea to try to acquire land and try to just leave it the way nature meant for it to be. I mean, that's really what we should be doing. Yeah, you know, there's a lot of opportunities as well with the state. As, um, we call it conservation events. So mm. if you're, if anybody's ever interested in acquiring like large parcels of that, um, there are opportunities, even with land trust, um, mm -hmm. so that they'll help you purchase the land 
with the agreement that it's going to be for conservation. Not the way it is, yeah. yeah. That's wonderful. Because I think, I wish, you know, more people would do that instead of building something on it or, you know. Right. I mean, I'm wondering where is most of the land though? Is it mostly by the hiking trails that they have this land? Um, it's it's all over, but definitely oh, there's a lot um, in the Colorado area on you know, hiking trails. Um, mm -hmm. Some is privately owned, and you know, some there's some that's owned by the state as well. Yeah, yeah, I think that's great. Um, so I guess like, you know, we're going to have to wrap it up soon. So why don't you tell us about how people can find you and your organization and, you know, how they can find out about volunteer opportunities and learn more about native Hawaiian plants and everything. Yeah, so we have five events a month, uh, two being on, on site doing restoration work and then one doing um, cultural, which is Mahalo Pohaku, which is also a field valley. Um, then we have two events that go on around the island, one being Nature Hikes, guided by our botanists, learning about, you know, intact ecosystems. And then we also do a volunteer exchange program where we help out other people around uh, their organizations as well as their programs. And you can also find us at protectpreservehi.org. Um, but overall, <clears throat> no, we're just trying to spread awareness and community engagement. Um, just breaking people out of their social norms to kind of understand what's going on around them. Um, but yeah, and then you can also, we're very active on Instagram, Protect and Preserve Boy. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, we're out of time now, so we're going to have to wrap it up. Uh, but I'm Dr. Grace O'Neill. This is Healthy Planet on the Think Tech live streaming network series. We've been talking with Tyrone Monteri of Protect and Preserve Hawaii. Thanks to all of you for being here. Thanks to Michael, our broadcast engineer, and the rest of our crew at ThinkTech for hosting our show. And thanks to you, our listeners, for listening. I'll see you on July um, at the end of the month for more of Healthy Planet on ThinkTech, the show for people who care about their health and the health of our planet. Our next show will be featuring Lillian Kumick, vegan chef. We will be talking about her new projects. If you have ideas for the show, please contact me at Healthy Planet ThinkTech at uh, gmail.com. Check out my website at graceinhawaii.com for more information on my projects, including future show guests. I'm Dr. Grace O'Neill. Aloha, everyone. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.